loss and joy, grief and gratitude. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As you heard in the children's story, I grew up in Detroit. I only raised one monarch caterpillar, but it was a signal event in my childhood. Um, found it in the milkweed growing along the ditch. And so that's part of the explanation for this title of Michigan, My Michigan, because um, at, at the time I thought I had a great childhood, but then I started learning about the other states out west. I graduated Michigan State University in 1974, and every summer starting in 1970 when I became 18 years old and I was old enough, I headed out west and I worked in national parks, anything I could do, primarily cleaning toilets and making beds in the cabins and hotels there, something really grateful for. But what shifted for me and I should mention as well that in the decades afterwards, I lived in Alaska for 10 years, I lived in Seattle for five, always heading out, climbing mountains, kayaking in the sea, just enjoying the forests and the mountains, and being a very healthy young person who could climb mountains back in the days. <laughs> and not quite as healthy anymore. I'm in a different stage of life, just like those monarch caterpillars. And what I find fascinating is that I love being back in Michigan, not just because I bonded on the smells of the greenery when I was a kid and all the lakes everywhere, vacationed at Lake Huron, um, but I feel very safe here. And that was something I could never have expected when I was young. I felt safe everywhere I went. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I see a lot of you felt that way too. And so this past spring, Michael and I spent the month of April, we were in Phoenix, and then we were uh, visited Prescott, and he was doing some sermons in a variety of UU congregations and UCC out there as well. Uh, we were in southwestern Durango, Colorado, visiting longtime friends there. At the very end of April, we arrived in Durango, and we just said, yay! We looked out from our house where we parked and we could see a mountain that had snow on it. None of the mountains in Arizona, nothing in Flagstaff, nothing had snow because they had the worst precipitation year they'd ever had in terms of not having precipitation. And then when you got it, it was rain or it already melted. They never had so little snow there. So we said, snow! And she looked at me and she said, oh, Connie, I've talked to the old timers here. Now she grew up in Colorado, so 50, almost 60 years. But she said, I've talked to the old timers here. They've never seen that little snow. Yeah. And almost to the day, one month later, I get an email from her and she said, pray for us or give positive thoughts. We've got a big fire here. It took two months for that fire to finally be contained. They were only worried that it would come their way for the first couple weeks. But then the firefighters made it move into the wilderness, so Durango was no longer in danger. But what they had during the fire was... Exactly. What we get our beautiful red sunsets with, I remember it was three years or so ago when the boreal forest was just going down in Canada and Alaska. Boy, did we have the beautiful sunsets. We don't smell it because the particles that sulfur and so forth are up high enough there, so we don't get the negative side of it. But from now on, whenever you see those red sunsets in fire season, you know there's people suffering, and plants and animals, of course. So she had smoke for two months. She said they even bought uh, uh, the respiratory devices, she said, so that they could spend longer time outside. And then several times, once even before the fire was out, they got flash flood warnings. Now, we probably don't understand that in Michigan, why when you lose a whole steep mountainside of entirely conifer trees, burns the soil. So what that means, you get these rains, even a half inch, a quarter inch. 
and boom, it can't soak in, it comes down, there's nothing to block it anymore. And so they had real fears that the Animas River would now turn into a flash flood. So there you have worried about being evacuation for fire for your homes, worried about whether you're damaging your lungs and you can't go out and enjoy the summer, two months, and then you worry about a flash flood. Now, I have to mention that when it comes to the fires, it's not entirely climate change, okay? It's not. Part of it was Smokey the Bear. I grew up with Smokey the Bear. And Smokey the Bear is real important here. We don't have these kind of conifer forests like Ponderosa Pine that require small fires all the time in order to stay low and not go up into the canopy. Smokey the Bear lived a little bit too long out there. And during that time, people like me felt so safe that they started building into the Ponderosa Pine Forest and upslope. And you know what direction fires go. You start anywhere, upslope. So then you had to have the firefighters spending more time trying to save homes in dangerous places. And five years ago, 19 of them in Arizona died because of that. Because they were trying to save some homes that were built into a real chaparral area. So we are living in a time now where we're not in a binary, it's just climate change, or no, it's not climate change that's causing these problems. It's very subtle. It's mixed. And it's dangerous times. And it's not just the dangers that I've cited. We know a couple of people. Oh my gosh, Michael developed a real friendship with a former Catholic monk when we spent quite a few uh, winters with friends at about 8,300 feet in Colorado, just south of Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado. He got to know this guy very well. I was spending my time thinning overgrowth uh, pinyon and juniper trees. Uh, it had been a ranch. And so I could go in and they're growing too close together after the cattle come out. And I went in there with a handsaw and over like three winters, boy did I get strong and I lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really enjoying that, doing mitigation. And then, boom, when was it, three years ago? All of a sudden, this community that it had a policy of nobody could cut any of the trees on their property without getting a yes from the, uh, the community council there, because it was up a slope of Mount Blanca there. Everybody went there, mostly retired, to enjoy the landscape before they needed to move back into a town somewhere to be with their grandkids or because they were becoming elderly and they couldn't handle 8,300 feet breathing anymore. Well, Michael's friend there uh, had expected to do that and what happened is after the Colorado Springs fire, about six years ago, I think it was, the insurance companies went, whoa. Almost half of the residents of that community lost their fire insurance. So what does that mean? It means you can't sell your house. You're going to be living there whether you can breathe there or not. So there's a level of understanding of what's scary about out there that I've only gained over the last five years or so. So what I'd like to do here is get into some personal stories of people I know. In fact, some of them I just emailed yesterday. Um, I said, wow, you know, I've been doing all this reading and the news reports, but Give me a personal story, so you'll hear some of that, too. One of the things I appreciate with Dr. Lou Yock is that he is such a scholar. And so I'm going to start off with an April 2018 paper published in Nature Climate Change by psychologists on the grief aspects of broadly environmental grief. But in this case, I'm talking about climate, what happens with climate, which we don't feel here. But boy, do they feel it out west. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'll move into some of these personal stories from people we know in the west. And I know, I don't think Claudia's here now. Is <coughs> here? No. I met her on the Badger when Michael had a UCC sermon he was giving over in Wisconsin. 
And I'm always asking people about climate change. And she said, oh, my son, he was evacuated last week. He was in the Reading fire. Any, anybody here have somebody that you know that has experienced these kind of things? Do I see any heads nodding? We're, okay. Yeah, more and more we're starting to understand what's going on out there, and we don't have that here. We don't have that here. So let me first read from Ecological Grief as a Mental Health Response to Climate Change-Related Loss. April 2018, two authors. And this is just a few paragraphs here from a very long report. We consider ecological grief to be a form of disenfranchised grief, or a grief that isn't publicly or openly acknowledged. Indeed, ecological grief and the associated work of mourning experienced in response to ecological losses are often left unconsidered or entirely absent in climate change narratives, policy, and research. In this light, grief and mourning can also question fundamental assumptions about what we choose to value and what we choose to grieve and mourn, including climate change-induced ecological loss and degradation. Among the first to describe the emotional pain of experienced ecological loss was ecologist and conservationist Aldo Leopold who noted that one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Aldo Leopold, uh, gosh, of uh, Sand County Almanac, some of you familiar with Sand County Almanac of Aldo Leopold? Okay. We here in Michigan live with 20th century environmental problems, and a lot of them have gotten better. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, the only way I'd ever seen a deer is we'd drive three hours to get up to my father's co-owned hunting property, but we'd have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning so that the only way we could see any deer, that I could see any deer in my whole life, was to spend three hours going up north and getting there not long after dawn. And not always did we see them at a distance. Now... We've got too many deer. I mean, it's eating everything, you know? Same goes with Aldo Leopold. He was restoring some land in Wisconsin and Sam County, and that had just been devastated by the logging. In the way, a lot, some of the Michigan lands have been as well. And so he was restoring the landscape in the hopes that his children, now he never did, but in the hopes that his children could hear the call of the Sandhill Cranes. Mm -hmm who on their way back south would get a chance to say, hey, this is good, I'm going to spend some time here. Now we, can. now we have them. I mean, on the Holmes property, I hear them in the morning, I hear them in the evening, you know, we sing to them when we go out, I mean, they're there. Things have gotten better. But this is 20th century kinds of environmental problems. In the 70s, with the Endangered Species Act, I mean, a lot has gone on. Improving, oh my gosh, you know, what the air is like now versus in the 50s when I was a kid in Detroit. It's really improved. But what's happening out west are 21st century environmental problems. And what that means is that you see the focus in different ways, but underlying that 21st century is that climate change. Things have changed. Rains don't come the way they used to come. And if snow comes, you'll have an episode in the winter when it rains and the snow melts. Even Seattle has to build another reservoir now because the snowy Cascade Mountains are no longer the reservoir for the dry times in the summer. It's all melted. It's not there anymore. They have to get another reservoir. Vancouver, city of Vancouver, City of Seattle and the city of Portland, those three, last week, had the worst air quality of any large city in the world. Worse than Beijing. This is the second summer that our friends on Whidbey Island in Puget Sound have... People live for the summers. 
in Seattle, it used to rain a lot during the rest of the time of the year. They live for the summers. A friend of ours, who was part of the UU church on Whidbey Island there, Puget Sound, he told us that last week he was supposed to go on a church hike somewhere and they had to cancel it. You wouldn't be able to see the Cascade Mountains. When they're gardening out there and they can hear foghorns from the big freighters that do commerce there, you know, you hear that during the foggy time, they're hearing that this summer because of the smoke. There was a journalist, she finally lost it. She wrote this blog and she said, I can't take this anymore. And last summer, um, there was a fire right across the way and so they had smoke. This summer again, they have smoke. She said, I was taking my kid to summer camp a week and she's going to have to stay inside the entire week because they're not letting the kids outside and I wanted her to be in nature. Okay, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting steamed up here. <laughs> but this is real. This is real what's going on there. I've collected a variety of things. We had friends out in the um, Mendocino complex fire. Got evacuated, took their ducks and their dogs with them. Had no idea whether they were going to lose their home. Fortunately, they didn't. But they come back. All the slopes, they were in a valley. All the slopes around them, gray, burned. How much fun is that to come back home? And then other people who have lost their homes. And you feel like survivor's guilt. Anyway, the one I want to read to you is that besides all the water wars going on there now, which has started again for the Colorado River, the cities are no longer tolerating anymore. They're starting to fight. Pueblo, Colorado started this against Phoenix, and I understand why. Water wars starting, smoke in a variety of places out there. Um, but there's a friend of mine who I asked her yesterday and said, could you just give me the personal side of this. And so I'm going to read to you her letter or email that she sent me. She's the one I mentioned at the beginning. It was called the 416 fire and it went for two months before it was finally deemed contained. She said, about three weeks ago I began two things. This is the psychological side of what happens after you're finished with the evacuation and the respirators and all this stuff. It's like, okay, Back to normal? Maybe. About three weeks ago, I began two things. Adding ashwagandha, that's some kind of an herb, to my herbal banquet of options to mitigate anxiety. And I've started back into therapy. This was prompted by the anxiety I was picking up vicariously from the clients who were coming in. She's an agent with State Farm. Mm -hmm. oh. I specifically asked her, say something about that. I can't even imagine what that would be like. Okay? She said, first, they were concerned about whether they had enough insurance to cover their dwelling replacement if it were consumed by fire. And then, about five or six weeks later, they came in again. This time, they were worried about the flooding that was inevitable on a wounded watershed no longer capable of holding the moisture that Mother Nature would throw at it. So they purchased additional flood coverage. The biggest revelations to come from two therapy visits so far, and she gives me four here. One, being involved in insurance and spending plenty of time in anticipatory thinking about risk possibilities, I have a high and frequent exposure to the realities of climate change. And having experienced it firsthand in our community recently, it's been in my face. The resounding theme of my exploration is a line that appeared one night as I wrote in my journal, I want to believe in the future. And, and this is point three. Therapy is also precipitating a recognition that we have events that are far beyond our control as an individual. Circumstances such as these have repercussions on our psyche and cause choices in life that are not solely our own doing. Such times seem to demand that we learn to hold both loss and joy, grief and gratitude. I was so 
happy that she said that because I was feeling pretty depressed yesterday having to get back into this. And she said, loss and joy, grief and gratitude, all in the same breath, if we were to remain sane. And that's why I have this t-shirt. Michigan, my Michigan. I saw this when we were at the UU in Midland oh, about six weeks ago, and somebody was wearing it. And I thought it meant, oh, so, you know, you've got deep roots here as an ancestor? Yeah, no, 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 no. We just feel rooted here. That's what it is. And so for her to say that, I said, like, yeah, the gratitude of being here with both the childhood imprinting element that I had from this and the safety I feel from having come in the dry and climate changing West made the difference. And so she said, finally, and I need to learn better professional boundaries, holding the dance between empathy on the one hand when witnessing others in high stress and self-care on the other hand for refueling myself. Stress and self-care are both cumulative so we need enough of the self-care to foster balance between them. Yeah. So, in the spirit of trying to, okay, this is sad, this is grief, let's do a little gratitude here. <laughs> do any of you know the 1902 version of Michigan, My Michigan? <laughs> hey, you want to come up here now? <laughs> I, got, I got it here. All you need to do to come in is, I'll, I'll sing the first line, and every time after line, all you have to do is Michigan by Michigan. Which tune are you using? Okay, oh gosh, I'm an A. No, which, there are two different. Oh, there the good one. I'm using the good one. <laughs> <laughs> I know two tunes. Okay, here we go. I'll, I'll do the first line, and then we'll do it again. A song to, to the fair state of mind, Michigan, my Michigan. A greater song than this is thine, Michigan, my Michigan. The whisper of the forest trees, the thunder of the inland sea, Unite in one grand symphony, Michigan, my Michigan. And as I always say, may the forest be with you. <laughs>